it's kind of a backwards world that we live in right now. And you've talked about it many times in your podcasts um, mm. that things are kind of opposite. So, mm. you know, we really shouldn't celebrate ill health. And just because you feel like you have energy to walk around during the day a little bit and you're overweight doesn't mean that you're metabolically healthy and it doesn't mean that you're not going to have major chronic illnesses down the line. So my job is to keep people from, uh, you know, developing those chronic illnesses as they age and also to, um, you know, if they do have it, to reverse it. And I have been able successfully to do that time and time again. And like, so I always say for my Olympians, you know, yeah, I want them to go to the Olympics. I want them to win a medal, but most importantly, I don't want them to get Alzheimer's. So I have a, a client, for instance, who's a, you know, Olympic athlete. She's a world or she's an American record holder. And um, she has the APOE4 uh, mm -hmm. allele, which means that she has problems metabolizing glucose. Yet in college, they were throwing all these carbohydrates at her and telling her things like she needs sugar. Like this is a great disservice and injustice to our athletes to tell them they need sugar. And when, of course, they're not testing their, their genealogy, they're not testing their genes to see what mm -hmm. kind of uh, alleles they have. So by having the APA4 allele, she's actually set up for a higher risk for Alzheimer's, um, even in her 20s. What people don't realize is that the amyloid beta plaque buildup and tau tangles, this happens early on. We only ever notice them later or get diagnosed later. So maybe you're diagnosed, uh, you know, early in your forties would be early, but usually it's even later than that, but it's already starting in your twenties. So I think a lot of people don't realize that and um, how terrible that these so-called nutritionists or dietitians, sports dietitians are saying you need, uh, you know, Powerade, you need Gatorade, you need, uh, you know, sugar to, to I, I even had one athlete, they said, you need pop tarts. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that head nutritionist was on the board for Kellogg's. So let's connect Ooh. the dots there. Right. Um, wow. So yeah, so I my interest is my uh, clients health. And of course, their athletic performance if they're athletes, but I want them to be thriving later in life as well. Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. Hey everyone, welcome back to Peak Human. This is Brian Sanders. Like I always say, start back at episode one. So many great episodes out there. I work really hard to get the best guests and a variety of guests for that matter. All kinds of different opinions. I share them all. I'm not scared to talk to anyone. If anyone has any suggestions, reach out to me. We're working away at the Food Lies film. It's a slow and steady process, rewriting and rewriting, making it the best it can be. Foodlies.org. We'll make a new trailer soon. That trailer does not represent what this film is gonna be like or the quality. We'll get that out soon. I also started nosetail.org while I'm making this film once I realized the great power of regenerative agriculture and quality meat. So check that out. Today I talked to Cynthia Monteleone. She's so awesome. She's over in Maui, in my home state of Hawaii. She sprints, she eats meat. She is a role model to all women and men, myself included. She's awesome. She's doing great things at 44. She's number one in the world for her age group at sprinting. She's powered by steak. There's so much great stuff in this episode. You'll never want to do traditional cardio again once you listen to this one. We also get her daughter involved, which is really cool. She's in high school. She's eating meat. She's doing great. She's feeling well. She's avoiding processed foods. She's speaking up for her fellow girls. Make sure to catch that at the end. Cynthia Monteleone is a world champion, the 400 meter, a mom of three, an author, and a metabolic analytics practitioner. It was no coincidence that when Cynthia decided to become the best in the world, she chose Charles Poliquin to study under. Her mentor shared his knowledge and encouraged her to keep up the fire for learning and achieving. Cynthia gets tremendous results because of her passion, which is to help others thrive. MAM, Maui Metabolics, grew out of this mission to encourage others to become their own superhero warrior self. When winning the gold, she ran faster at age 43 than she did as a Division I college track athlete. She attributes this to learning how to alter epigenetics to favor delayed aging, healthy biomarkers, and exceptional athletic performance. 
After listening to and consulting on hundreds of client cases, everyone from Olympians to the neighbor next door, she is adept at reading patterns and using her knowledge and experience to solve health and performance puzzles with easy protocols. She lives in Maui with her husband and three children. So, like I said, she's great. Check this one out. A few more words about nosetail.org. We have the primal ground beef with the organs mixed in. We have beef bacon. We have the low omega-6 pork and chicken. We also have the skin food made from the regenerative beef tallow. It's a whipped cream that is fantastic on any part of your skin. Your body needs food. It doesn't need chemicals. It's just coming back in stock next week, so check it out maybe Thursday or Friday on nosetail.org to put in an order. We have the biltong in stock. Best way to eat grass-fed meat on the go. This stuff's a real winner. Everyone loves it. Make yourself a box today. You can get the seasonings as well. There's tons of options for free shipping. Get it as a gift. Email us if you want to get a gift card for friends or family. That's all at nosetail.org. And everything else, go to saping.org. We have the program. We have the tribe. This is the best way to change your health, connect with other people, join the newsletter there, work with me or Dr. Gary. Everything is there. Support the show. Get the extended show notes. Support us on Patreon. It's all there. This is community powered. We do this without advertisers. Thanks so much, everyone. Share with a friend. Give it a review on iTunes. Those are free options to support the show. And please enjoy this one with Cynthia and her daughter at the end. Let's get it going. Hello, Cynthia. How's it going? Aloha, Brian. We're, it's going good. Bright and early here for me. But uh, yeah, well, another beautiful amazing. day in paradise. As you can see in my backyard, it's not a virtual background. <laughs> yeah, some people are like, is that a Zoom background? No, that's that's real. That's Maui. Yeah, just uh, my backyard. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, Maui is great. I grew up in Oahu, as people may know, who have been listening to the show for a while. But we Tried to connect with Cynthia while I was home for Christmas. Didn't quite work out. We're on different islands, but I'm glad to do this podcast now. Yes, I'm so appreciative of the uh, the chance to talk with you because I uh, I think uh, it was Mike Mutzel that was telling me like, oh, you you know, you and Brian are on the same page about a lot of things. <laughs> Well, I'm on the same page as Mike on a lot of things. I love me some Mike Mutzel, Metabolic Mike. If anyone doesn't know what we're talking about, you can high intensity health. You are on his show. I listened mm -hmm. to that podcast, which was great. And yeah, it's been a long time in the making. We were going to do a show for a while. So let's get into it. You are yeah. fast over 40. You, Well, that's your book title, but you also are fast over 40. Why don't you tell us about yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, so I like to say I'm just an average mom who kind of discovered superhero powers. And now it's my passion to help other people discover their superhero powers. Um, and so when I did run in college, I ran division one track in college. Um, I started just enjoying running at an early age. I ran around my property in upstate New York. We had uh, about 35 acres of land and I would just run everywhere. So I did enjoy running from an early age. But I never thought I would, you know, do it as a career or anything like that. Uh, in high school, I the PE teacher said, you look like a 400 meter runner. Or mm -hmm. she said, you are a 400 meter runner. And uh, now at 45 years old, I'm still a 400 meter runner. So she was right. Uh, so I ran track in high school, was recruited to college. And um, then I didn't run at all, like at all for 20, over 20 years. So I had my kids, I have three children, um, you know, started a career and, you know, I jogged with friends or something like that here and there, but um, nothing regular and definitely not sprinting. Uh, so after I had my last child, I had just finished breastfeeding, I believe. I think he was like two. Um, my daughter, who at the time was 11, said to me, Mom, I want to run track in college like you did on scholarship. Um, can you train me for the 400 meters? And I said, okay, sure. Well, let's get on the track and do one lap around and see how fast or slow we are. And, um, you know, we charged that first corner and came halfway through and ran out of gas and basically crawled over the finish line. <laughs> Hardest 400 of my life uh, in about a minute and 30 seconds, which is not very fast. Mm -hmm. And um, so for race pace anyway. And so, uh, yeah, that's where we started. And uh, my journey took me to study under my mentor, Charles Polican, um, and learn all of this 
amazing knowledge that I'm now able to share with my clients who are Olympians, professional athletes, and also people who have um, things that like my, my doctor sends me his patients when he can't figure out what's wrong with them, usually autoimmune issues. So that's basically what I do. I'm a metabolic practitioner. And I wrote this book fast over 40 so that I could share a brief summary of basically some tips and tricks of how you can get to discover your superhero warrior self. And as we know, it's not just nutrition, it's a whole lifestyle. I love that. Well, you know, you're combining everything that I love, right? Sprinting, <laughs> the movement, you're, you're a health practitioner yourself, you're still active doing races in your 40s. I am not there yet. Right, so I, took me, I, I skipped over the part where uh, two, three years into my journey, I became a world champion. I forgot that part. <laughs> oh, just the <laughs> most important, important part. It might, might be a little important. And the best part about that, though, was that uh, it was an indoor race, uh, indoor world championships. I ran that time faster than I did in college. And that is not supposed to happen. Okay, we're supposed to get slower as we age. And, you know, eventually, probably I'll get slower. But um, we're, you know, what it, what's happening, I guess, I tried to break down what is happening for me to be able to run faster at age 43 than I did in my 20s when I'm supposed to be peaking, right? So uh, that's kind of how I break everything down. Well, that's a great message because I think it, we're in this modern paradigm where we think we have all these preconceptions, right? You're like, oh yeah, you're, when you get into your 40s and 50s, you're, everyone's on three medications, so that's just normal, right? You, you, we're just yeah. talking about this paradigm where you, you just assume it's normal and it's not. So people like you are showing that it's not normal and just disproving <laughs> this, this crazy health paradigm that we have. And I, yeah, a lot of people are, I love that. It, it just, I'm obsessed with it. Sh Dr. Sean O'Mara, I know you are a fan of his as well. Yes. He's into the sprinting thing or just guys like Yeah, Mark and he's got, the, he's got the hardcore scientific evidence, you know? He's like, here's the scan of a sprinter. Here's the scan of a non-sprinter uh, as far as the visceral fat goes. Like he had that grant from the National Science Foundation to study visceral fat. And so, he, I mean, he's got the hard evidence. And I mean, and he's thriving himself which is what I love is that you, Sean, Mike, like uh, Sean Baker, even like here are all these people who are thriving themselves. Like, who are you getting your advice from? Are you getting your advice from someone who is thriving? Um, you know, so that I like to point that out too. Like who's it, or is it an overweight doctor who has he uh, heart problems trying to give you heart advice? Like, you know, it's not that I'm uh, totally anti-Western medicine or anything, but you know, I think a lot of people look at these influencers on uh, social media and you have to, yeah, I mean, you have to really think where, where do I want to get my advice from? And for me, I wanted to get my advice from the best in the world when I wanted to be a world champion. So I, th I found, okay, who, who makes the most world champions? Charles Polican. So I'm going to go to him and I'm going to learn what was it. So I think that's part of champion mentality. Um, and I, my belief is that everyone can be a champion in their daily life. So seek out those who are thriving, seek out those who are accomplishing the goals that you want to accomplish and start asking questions. So important. Yeah, I, I just mentioned Mark Sisson too at the end because he's 65, 66, whatever he is, maybe 67 by now. He's a guy I want to take advice from. That's how I want to look at his age. And then I, I think some people think it's rude to say don't take advice from a fat, out of shape, sick doctor. But why would you, you know, if you, yeah, if you were body, if you wanted to go become a bodybuilder, would you take advice from a fat or a skinny <laughs> person, you know? Right. It, it, right. It's just, and it's just, uh, just Charles fat. was notorious. Yeah. Charles was notorious for that. He actually um, had a reputation for kicking people out of his seminars if they were out of shape. He did not want them representing his name. Um, so he would basically just kick them out if they were if they were you know not doing what they were taught to be to to do like basically like they were, they would maybe take a they were personal trainers right so they took personal training certification and then came in severely overweight and out of shape and he's like no like i'm not certifying you i don't want you to represent because you're obviously mm -hmm. not doing what you learned so i mean he was pretty hardcore uh, but <laughs> uh, yeah so got to live the lifestyle absolutely that if mm -hmm. you could uh, you still have abs i noticed that when the camera was zoomed out like you you like walk around with abs you know like i walk around with abs you gotta live the lifestyle right yeah i just actually interviewed um for my warrior community i interviewed this awesome gal named christina elder and she's just like she's a master's athlete she's in her 30s mid 30s and she said she worked out 
constantly in college. She was an 800 meter runner, division one, like she was, and then she also played soccer. So she was training mm. all the time. And she said, I never had abs until I actually changed my diet. And she was carnivore um, throughout her last pregnancy. And she's a meat based athlete. She's almost, she's not strictly carnivore right now, but she's almost, um, almost strictly, you know, she's very mm -hmm. heavily animal protein based. So I was interviewing her about that because we have that in common where we are, you know, very animal protein based in our racing uh, strategy and that sort of thing. So we rely on, I always say steak adapted. I'm steak adapted. You can be steak great adapted. fat adapted or carbohydrate adapted. I'm steak adapted. That is what makes me thrive. And uh, there are a lot of different reasons we can get into that if you want. But uh, it was fascinating because the whole ab thing, I mean, it has to do with what you're eating, really. You can, you know, uh, train your abdominal muscles all you want, but if, unless you're metabolically, uh, you know, at a certain body fat percentage, then, and for women, optimal performance is between 12 and 15% is what I've found. And for men, it's under 10%, about 6 to 10%. So, so the abs well, are important. Yeah, yeah, I know you, you, uh, you brought that up before, and I think that's really interesting because I've never heard it. And some people will just say, you can be healthy at any size. Some people will try to say you can be optimal at any size, but I mean, there's real like kind of data on this. Yeah. I don't, you know, it's just, a, it's kind of a backwards world that we live in right now. And you've talked about it many times in your podcast um, mm. that things are kind of opposite. So, mm. you know, we really shouldn't celebrate ill health. And just because you feel like you have energy to walk around during the day a little bit and you're overweight doesn't mean that you're metabolically healthy and it doesn't mean that you're not going to have major chronic illnesses down the line. So my job is to keep people from, uh, you know, developing those chronic illnesses as they age and also to, um, you know, if they do have it, to reverse it. And I have been able successfully to do that time and time again. And like, so I always say for my Olympians, you know, yeah, I want them to go to the Olympics. I want them to win a medal, but most importantly, I don't want them to get Alzheimer's. So I have a, a client, for instance, who's a, you know, Olympic athlete. She's a world or she's an American record holder. And um, she has the APOE4 uh, mm -hmm. allele, which means that she has problems metabolizing glucose. Yet in college, they were throwing all these carbohydrates at her and telling her things like she needs sugar. Like this is a great disservice and injustice to our athletes to tell them they need sugar. And when, of course, they're not testing their, their genealogy, they're not testing their genes to see what mm -hmm. kind of uh, alleles they have. So by having the APA4 allele, she's actually set up for a higher risk for Alzheimer's, um, even in her 20s. What people don't realize is that the amyloid beta plaque buildup and tau tangles, this happens early on. We only ever notice them later or get diagnosed later. So maybe you're diagnosed, uh, you know, early in your forties would be early, but usually it's even later than that, but it's already starting in your twenties. So I think a lot of people don't realize that and um, how terrible that these so-called nutritionists or dietitians, sports dietitians are saying, you need, uh, you know, Powerade, you need Gatorade, you need, uh, you know, sugar to, to I, I even had one athlete, they said, you need pop tarts. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that head nutritionist was on the board for Kellogg's. So let's connect Ooh. the dots there. Right. Um, wow. so yeah, there, so I, my interest is my, uh, client's health and of course their athletic performance if they're athletes, but I want them to be thriving later in life as well. I love that. So I need to go back into this APOE4 thing. Cause it, it really, it really made sense to me once I figured this part out. The people with the APOE4 gene are said to have way higher risk of Alzheimer's. It's almost the opposite. It's They have way more problem dealing with modern foods and refined carbs and sugars and all that. So it's not that they are more like, well, they get Alzheimer's more of the time because we keep pushing these types of diets. So they are not, they have this more of an ancient genotype that's used to more ancient foods, which means meat and fat. That's right. Yes. And those clients are thriving off of that meat and fat. Absolutely. So which is a misconception because if you're, especially if you're a track athlete, you think, okay, carb up, pasta parties, you know, the, all of the wrong information. <laughs> it, it may work when you're young and it may work for a while, but there's so many people that have the repercussions. Mark Sisson being one of them talks about all the repercussions he had doing, you know, all these athletics with the high carbs 
professor tim noakes same thing same thing mm -hmm. actually man there's so many things i want to get into I'll try not to jump around yeah too i much, know but... there are there are a lot there's a lot we can talk about well, so, so here go. i gotta start <laughs> when you're talking about these athletes i trained for a decathlon at ucla two years ago and the, all the athletes there thought i was insane for when i was 35 36 and they're all in their 20s and they're all just eating the high carb diet and i was like oh i didn't even eat today they're like what and like and, and i was trying to explain to them like yeah i just you know i'm eating meat and fat and you know some avocado and you know whatever else sauerkraut and stuff and they're just like what so where do you get your carbs from i'm like no no no. that's the whole point i'm not i'm not eating the carbs i'm i'm gonna do this thing fat adapted uh so mm -hmm. i guess yeah i we can get into this fat adapted uh sports you know even these explosive events like a hundred meter dash you don't need carbs yeah this is a misconception and um oh gosh like they'll say well the science says you know glucose is the most readily available energy source and it's the easiest and all this other stuff so you know they they'll talk to they being the uh, carb proponents will talk to their blue in the face about what it looks like on paper but what I experience, you know, from uh, firsthand experience clinically, basically, is that the opposite seems to be true. And it is for explosive athletics as well. So for a while, people thought, oh, you can't be keto or, or anything like that or carnivore and mm -hmm. um, do any kind of power sport. But they did finally have a research article that backed up some gymnasts that not only did they not lose power, uh, they increased their performance because their body fat de decreased into optimum performance level. So the research is there if you look for it. But frankly, we just know because it, it's working in everyday situations that you can use the fat for fuel and you're going to have um, you're going to have more energy, actually more sustainable energy. And especially important for me is that you don't have this carb crash. So you're not, uh, you know, you have maybe the people who have oatmeal for breakfast or, you know, carbs for breakfast, cereal, something like that. And then two hours later, they need to replenish those carbs or else they're having that blood sugar crash. And that along with that comes um, some nerve problems. So you'll find those people are more anxious. They're more nervous about their competition. Um, where I found the fat adapted athletes or, you know, really actually red meat adapted athletes, especially with the red meats high in the B12 and folate. And we know that B12 and folate is what helps make our myelin sheaths, which surround coat our nerves. So you'll find that those athletes are totally calm. Like they maybe have some eustress, some excitement, but they're not sitting there like freaking out and, oh, I gotta need, eat another granola bar or take a, a fuel gel before I go. Like they're, it's just a totally night and day difference that you see. And, um, and they are performing well. So for me this year, I switched up my training a little bit and I, uh, I don't really run at the 200s, my fun race. And because I had an opportunity to have some local track meets that were uh, sanctioned, which is, we've never had here on Maui, we've, we've never had like official time track meets. Um, I jumped into those on the weekends and I ran the 200. And uh, I ended up running faster than I did three years ago, nearly as fast as I did in college. Uh, after just a few weeks of, you know, maybe about a month of training for the 200. So I beat my master's PR mm -hmm. from when I was 43. So again, I'm getting faster as I get older. One, that's not supposed to happen, supposedly. Two, mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely not supposed to happen with me eating steak right before my race. <laughs> but well, what I, I say that. is, hey, it's got carnitine, carnosine, all the amino acids, like just... It, it makes sense on why it works if you break it down. Yes, you talked about the, your book, the carnitine, carnosine, and that you bring a little baggie of steak and you eat it like, not, was it 90 minutes before the race? Yeah, that time I was eating it 90 minutes. Now I, I find that um, I'm totally fine with eating it even 30 minutes before the race. So now I try to make sure it just be, depends on how hungry I am and ha what time of day my race is, how much I've already eaten. So if I've eaten a full breakfast of meat, nuts and berries, and then I've had a protein shake, and then I've also had lunch, and then my race is after that, then maybe I won't eat quite as much. But mm -hmm. I definitely within that hour window now try to um, try to consume it. And the carni from the research that I've read, carnosine from beef becomes most bioavailable 30 minutes uh, 
it's like it peaks at 30 minutes mm. or so between 30 minutes and an hour after consumption and it has a higher carnosine content than uh or sorry it's more bio 90 percent more bioavailable than in a supplement so you'd have to take a lot more supplements to or a lot of people take beta alanine which is the precursor to carnitine right so they take that for lactic buffers or lactate buffers um, but really the beef is like the perfect package I mean, nature, you can't beat nature, right? It's the perfect package of all the nutrients and all the amino acids that you need. You're like a spokeswoman for my whole <laughs> my whole message and my <laughs> film and everything. Beef has it all. It, it's funny, all these other things like supplements are just trying to mimic it and everything in the world, mm -hmm. vegan, plant-based And they're getting burgers. the ratios wrong, frankly. I think oh, they're getting the ratios wrong. It's impossible to get right. They're getting it wrong. It's not as bioavailable. It's not the right forms. It, it, it's all kinds of wrong. It's just eat, mm -hmm. eat meat and it, it all works out. And yes. it's great that some of these other athletes are doing it. I had Zach Bitter on. People may know about him. He's a world record holder in ultra marathons and he's very steak adapted. And uh, yes. Yeah, I, I was on Zach's podcast as well. And um, the, you know, the highlight for me was when I told him, um, uh, but Zach, don't you know that, you know, sprinting makes you smarter than <laughs> distance running? Uh, we can get into that too. But the increase in BDNF, brain derived neurotropic factor, uh, makes, makes you actually smarter and happier, according to the science and real life. And uh, so I was teasing him like, okay, like how long are you going to be doing this endurance running though? Because, and then he did admit that probably not forever, you know, because he does understand that there are some health repercussions from doing endurance training. Uh, but that was pretty funny. I was messing with him. It's like, didn't you know sprinters are smarter? <laughs> well, I like the, <laughs> you know, great. I like the meme about the sprinters uh, get, uh, next to the marathoners and who do you want to look like? And the sprinters have giant quads and are really ripped and the marathoners mm -hmm. are all basically emaciated. But. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I always say, Hey, whatever gets you up off the couch and exercising fine, like absolutely do it. But what my passion is to share is that it doesn't have to be a marathon. So I think what happens is people like, especially women, they turn 40 and they think, okay, um, I have to get back in shape because that's about the time their hormones are changing and they're starting to hold more uh, body fat. And really they don't realize that they need an adjustment in nutrition and supplements and different things like that. Um, you know, they're not absorbing protein as much by that time. So they think, okay, well, I'm going to train for a marathon. Like it's a trend. And mm -hmm. so I would like for the trend to not be to train for a marathon, but to be to train for sprinting. Because in the long run, the sprinting is what's going to give you better biomarkers for aging. Absolutely, 100%. Like it's, you know, increasing that BDNF. So when you increase the BDNF, you're not only getting, you know, the happier and the smarter, but that neuroplasticity is increasing. Uh, so that means your gray matter is not diminishing, which of course we know also is associated with Alzheimer's, for instance. So you're keeping your brain healthy. You're keeping your body metabolically healthy. Of course, you can burn fat better with that high intensity type of work, the sprint interval training. Um, you're pounding on your bones more. So your bone density is going to increase. People think that bones are these concrete structures, but they're actually living tissue that we regenerate every 10 years. So I always say like, you can make the choice today, what kind of bones you're gonna have in 10 years. And uh, animal protein based and, and high intensity type workouts is, you know, that's the way to go. And uh, I think people are intimidated by sprinting though. It's easier for them to pop in some headphones and go for a long jog uh, because it's not as intense. It's not as hard to start, but um, I try to make it easy for people to understand one, how to do it and two, how to start. So that's what the, also the point of my book was. It's, and it's also just more efficient too. I mean, everything better is about sprinting. It, I, I have a big problem with the low and slow jogging and all that type of stuff. And I try not to discourage people. Like you said, anything that gets you up and if you really enjoy it or people say, this is my one way to de-stress and I just, I love it. Or I get this runner's high. I'm like, okay. 100% do that. Just don't think that this is the only way to do it. Because I think just like the nutrition world where we're saying, oh, you, you know, these low fat diets or you need to avoid meat or all these conventional ways we tell people are to lose weight or you have to count calories and all that stuff. And this is the way to lose weight. It, it, it screws people, I think. So it's like if, if they think 
the way to g- get healthy and to do car you have to do cardio like to have cardiovascular health you need to jog that's not true there's many ways to do cardio and you can get a great cardio workout by sprinting and you can mm-hmm. do it in a short time and you can do all the things that you just said all the benefits it's it has all the benefits if you just do this brief intense type of workouts and well that's why my phrase is eat densely move intensely right it's like love it, it. yeah it, it's the key well so eating animal foods and sprinting that's eat densely move intensely yes absolutely and um one thing though about you said you know de-stress so like yeah it is kind of uh, therapeutic sometimes for people to run the long slow distance but how far are they running you know are they running for 20 minutes or are they running are they starting to run a lot of mileage because what uh, the science shows is that actually the longer the mileage, the more stress you have because it's like uh, your, your cortisol increases. And there's a great article uh, that came out last year from the Journal of Sports Medicine, I believe, Sports Nutrition. Um, uh, so they reviewed all the different gut bacteria that di- in the different types of athletes. And they found that endurance runners actually have a lot of gastrointestinal distress, which you know if you actually talk to anybody who does any kind of long distance training. Um, and th- it's because their gut bacteria are changing to adapt to their training which is causing an increase in cortisol because it's like you're constantly under stress because we know that cortisol increases as we exercise. But with sprinting, it's just enough to send some, uh, you know, some adaptive uh, inflammation to make us stronger, but it's not too much that it sends us into the overly uh, overstimulation or over cortisol, over stress situation as endurance training does. And this is for cycling or running or any kind of endurance training. Um, so there really is a lot of research on the changes in the gut microbiome that come from your exercise, which I don't think anybody realizes that the type of exercise actually changes your gut bacteria activity, not only the types of foods you eat. It's super interesting. You sent me the paper. It's like Privotella, the the strain, and mm-hmm. I can link to it in the show notes. And yeah, I also wanted to mention about the 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 long distance the calcium scores i talked to another guest about this and found some studies on it that these marathoners have higher coronary artery calcium scores because of this overtraining and there are repercussions to overtraining and and that happens Mm -hmm. a lot and uh so there's people okay for one there's an article that i was going to post about but i just didn't want to keep hating on these joggers but there it was and it was kind of just a stupid article from some you know, you're not, but that's not hating on them. You're actually showing love by sharing, you know, the information that you've discovered. That'd be like saying I'm, I'm hating on people who are over, who are obese or something like that by explaining that, you know, you can get metabolically healthy. Like it's actually, you're showing love. I guess so. so. Yeah. Well, I want to spread this information because, you know, this article, the woman said, I, I became fat from training for a marathon. And they had the before and after mm-hmm. picture and she gained like all this weight because she was doing all the things you talked about. And then you, you eat all the goos and all the Gatorades and it, mm-hmm. you know, people will say, well, it's just because of course she was eating all these refined carbs, but we're saying there's more to it. There's, of course it's that. And she's overly stressing her body, probably overtraining, probably just even becoming more hungry. If you're doing these long endurance mm-hmm. exercises, I think it's a worse way to lose weight. That, right? Again, exactly. like, yeah, like going back to Christina and her story, like she trained constantly in college and she said she didn't have abs until she's, you know, she's changed her diet and stopped doing that. So basically you can train so much that you're increasing your cortisol and one place that we know the cortisol, you know, what happens when you have high cortisol is that it stores in your abdominal region. So uh, it's, it's totally makes sense to me that if you're on the treadmill for you know an hour, then you're you're actually storing body fat. You're not burning the body fat. Um, and I've even helped change. Like my husband coaches wrestlers, so he's been coaching mm-hmm. wrestling for 20 years. Um, we had the number one female high school wrestler in the nation last year. He did the wrestling coaching. I did the strength coaching and metabolic coaching for her. Um, and what I introduced to his wrestling uh, students was that instead of doing this mileage, like, you know, wrestlers, okay, you know, got to burn fat or drop weight, go for these long mileage runs. But uh, really, 
what happens is they end up storing body fat sometimes. It doesn't work for them. And uh, they're more, that's not what their sport does. Their sport isn't long and slow and steady. It's explosive mm -hmm. rest, explosive rest. I'm like, that's sprint interval training. And sure enough, when we would have Olympians here, like uh, Kyle Snyder or something like this, like, you know, gold medal Olympians, we would ask them, what do you do for your workouts? And they would always say repeat 400s, which, ooh, really hardcore sprinting. Uh, with a little bit of rest and uh, very definitely getting you in that lactate zone where you're increasing growth hormone. Uh, but they would do like four to six 400s with about a minute to a minute and 30 rest um, at, you know, probably 80% capacity wow. or whatever they can handle. So it wasn't long, slow distance. It wasn't mileage. It was, you know, sprint interval training, basically. It's so important to, for me. I just want to let people know about this. Yeah, you don't have to do it. Yeah. You can still go for your jogs, but just know it's it's not the efficient way to do it. It's not the best way. It's could be harming you. I, I and it's not as good for your brain. Like, why are you doing it? Yeah, it's not as good, yeah, like, not as good for your you brain. Have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Am I doing it because I need to de stress? Well, there are other methods for that meditation. You know, for one thing, uh, you know, you could do some journaling, goal goal writing, things like that. Um, but if you're doing it and pff, nothing de-stresses better than the sprinting anyway, I don't know if you've felt those endorphins after you're sprinting, right? You can attest to that. Like you just feel it's, so amazing. It's so if you think best, that you're yeah. getting this, yeah, if you think you're getting those endorphins from the long, slow distance, wait till you try sprinting. Like, wow, it just feels amazing. You feel like a superhero because you're able to run fast and running fast is fun. Um, now, I'm not encouraging anyone to go and to listen to this podcast and get out there and run as fast as they can. That's not how you start. <laughs> um, but I do encourage people to start walking up a hill um, and, you know, getting that resistance. It forces your foot into the correct position. Um, you're getting to strengthen all of the tendons and muscles that you'll need for sprinting. Uh, and in my book, I kind of do a little step by step of you can go from hill sprinting uh, hill walking to hill jogging, and then a little bit increase the speed. This is over the course of months, and then move to a field, um, not even a track. So I don't even have people on a track for several months. Um, but you're still going to reap the benefits right away from that resistance from the hill, as opposed to just shuffling around, uh, you know, the sidewalks or the roads. Yeah, yeah, you, you got to start slow. I, I think people will do that naturally. It's, it's kind of hard to just start from nothing and start sprinting all out. So uh, but yes, you can get injured and definitely start slow, work up to it. And that's the best. Yeah, I've never had runners high like when I when I do sprinting. I, it feels amazing. It, just yeah, mm -hmm. just moving down this. I, I mean, I'll sprint on the side of the road. I'll, I'll sprint anywhere. And uh, I, I just I've never felt so good. And I've done long distance. I've tried it. And I just it's not for me. But that's what I'm saying. I just want to give this information. I some of it is. I have this bias. Like I love sprinting. Like I've sprinted since <laughs> I was five years old. I grew up in Hawaii. Okay. I'll go back into some Hawaii stuff. I grew up barefoot in Hawaii all until seventh grade. They made me wear the, some flip flops, but I was sprinted <laughs> every day. I sprinted I mm -hmm. probably sp until I turned probably 30. I sp sprinted. Well, I was trying to do the math. I've sprinted more days in my life than I haven't because wow. I played sports. All throughout my life, mm -hmm. I still play sports every week, many times a week. And I've always just loved sprinting. I, my whole life was sprinting, running to school, running to the uh, cafeteria and back every day. It was like a race. I don't know why. Maybe it was a Hawaii thing. It was just barefoot. And you just had to <laughs> my, run. Yeah, I was just thinking that reminds me of my son. My youngest just refuses to ever wear shoes. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, you could get down that rabbit hole too about how it changes your foot structure. I have really high arches. Yeah. I think it's from not mm -hmm. wearing shoes and I have great arches, great um, whatever, you know, mechanics in my my legs and feet. And I attribute that to not being bound up in shoes. And there, there's research about it too. You can look up. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I what? just interviewed um, John McDowell, who is a, um, he basically is a, a really well-trained, uh, Polican trained coach as well. And he's, uh, his specialty is sprinting. He was a hurdler. And um, he talks about a, a barefoot type shoe. Um, I think that's going to come out on my podcast in a, in a few days. But um, it was really interesting to hear because it was just like, I interviewed a bunch of people this month on sprint techniques for beginners. So if anyone's interested in beginning, like they can definitely check that out. And I have a warrior community that has a whole like a uh, private Facebook type group. It's called Circle that they support each other in beginning sprinting, which is really nice um, because they're all, you know, kind of 
on the same journey. Mm -hmm. But he talks about that, about um, not actually training in them, but walking around in them and how it's, it's, it just makes all the difference in strengthening. So I, I'm totally on board with that as well. And for us, we do beach running once a week in order mm. to do the same thing. So we run um, in my, I do as a service to my community, I uh, offer, I host beach running mm. in Kanapali, which is getting a little busy right now. <laughs> We're starting to have to run around mm -hmm. people, uh, but uh, we do sprint sprints on the beach, um, and we anyone's welcome to join. and I and I give advice on how to breathe, and we know what your form should look like, and things like that. Uh, because in my book as well, I talk about part of building a solid foundation for being a superhero warrior is to give back to your community. It's very important. Um, so I try to do that at any chance I can, uh, and that's one of the ways. But that actually will strengthen the feet as well. You, you can tell because when you, well, I, I did some beach sprinting, you know, not so often because I'm, I'm only home so often and my feet were so sore after, right? So you can tell how you're not used to it when you, when you don't mm -hmm. do it for a while. But. Right. And um, John was saying that you strike differently when you're in your shoes because you have the support of the cushioning of the shoes. So you're actually going to be more likely to do something like heel striking or, you know, do incorrect foot patterns. Uh, so yeah, he said, but if you, if you're just barefoot, you're less likely, you're more likely to have the correct form basically. And that travels all the way up the kinetic chain. So then that makes you less likely injured in like less likely to be injured. And um, again, not to beat up on long, slow distance, but the overuse injuries that come with that are also something to pay attention to because if you're a 40 and you want to get in shape and you start training for a marathon and you keep doing it, then eventually you're also going to get overuse injuries and you're not going to be able to train for a period of time. And so again, I have to go back to why are you doing it? Are you doing it to de-stress? Are you doing it to get in shape? Are you doing it to keep your heart healthy? Well, I mean, there, the sprinting is a better choice for all of those things. Are you doing it for your brain health? Sprinting is the better choice. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying it to mm -hmm. discourage anyone from jogging if that's what you like to do. And that's the only thing that's going to keep you moving. But there, I just like to spread the message that there is a better way. There is another way and there is, and it's shown to be the better way. So I don't want people to have overuse injuries because then if they have, are, they're injured and they can't run for a few months or, uh, you know, half a year, or a year, then they're not hitting any of those goals that they're doing the original exercise for. Um, now with sprinting, people think, okay, well I, well, I might pull a hamstring. Well, yeah, if you just go out and you just try to run as fast as you can without any preparation, then you might do that. But and uh, if you start gradually and you work your way up and do some strength training, all around, it looks like from what we've seen, from what you've seen, what I've seen, from what my athletes are doing, even my older athletes, it is really the formula for success in aging. Great points, great points. And oh, I back to the just fat loss part. I've never seen such rapid fat loss when I bring sprinting back in. Like I, I can go away from it for a while. And I've talked about this before in other podcasts where I, I did everything the same, ate the same diet, did the same workouts, but then, you know, sprinting or not, or between cardio and it, it's lights night and day. And uh, also I'll throw this into yeah, the stress science part. behind that too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Fat loss and Dr. Sean Amara can talk, talks about that and you can listen to my podcast with him, but uh, I'll bring up the de-stressing part too. So Dr. Gary has all, my business partner is always into, he's like, this is what I do. He was always resistant to me talking about it. He's like, I'm not a sprinter like you, like, don't worry about it. This is how I de-stress. <laughs> and then, but then he just started doing it. So instead of just going on a jog for 30 minutes, he would do sprint and then the, a slow walk jog then the sprint and then slow walk jog it, it's not that much different and he can still be out there for 30 minutes and he can still have the de-stress whatever much it better. is and mm -hmm. he's like oh my god he's like nine day he's like i love it i'm hooked i get it now just change just change yeah. it up yeah you can actually that that's also a nice way to to um ease into it if that's what you're doing already is jogging um, because you can just end up changing the pacing and eventually you can get more intense in the speed part of it and then more resting like walking you know or not walking eventually in mm -hmm. the other part of it but if that's how you want to do it to start with any kind of increase in intensity like that is going to stimulate your catecholamines more and then that causes you to keep burning fat for about two hours or more after you finish your workout as opposed to if you were long slow distance running. That's another one. I saw a study 
I don't, maybe I can include in the show notes, but yes, you have this longer period of of cardiovascular, you know, conditioning basically by breathing harder and all that type of stuff. So you you end up burning more calories anyway. If that's your goal, then just the higher intensity should be your method. Right. right. So again, what is your goal? And let's point you to the best way to do it, the most efficient way. Well, you know, it's it's sounding like it's sort of this plant based versus animal based diet thing where we're people are saying oh but you can get all your nutrients if you supplement and you eat a plant-based diet and you supplement with this and you do that i'm like well it's just not going to be as good you know so you can still do it <laughs> if people still want to do the plant-based diet after you learn all this info go right ahead but it's just not the right way that's me being the sprinting zealot you know we're over here we're, we're sounding like the sprinting zealots but i'm just saying you you're saying yeah we're every, just sharing side, the information. every angle every angle yeah, is just not at, as good mm -hmm. Right. You can, uh, of course, make your own choice. You have the freedom to make your own choice if you would like to do, continue to do long, slow distance. But if you come back to me and you say, I'm injured, I'm uh, overtrained, I have gastrointestinal distress, I'm not losing as much body fat, then I'm going to say that's because the other direction is the way to go. So, um, yeah, and um, the plant-based, as far as the plant-based goes, uh, from experience, I can tell you in the master's world, anyone who I've seen has been uh, pretty plant-based, or you know what, even in the elite world in track and field, um, I see the plant-based and I see they lose power and I see that they get injured quite a bit. Um, same for carbohydrate adapted. I can see when people go off season and they start eating uh, sugar and, you know, things like that, they start training again, they got they have injury issues, hamstring problems, especially lower. seems like the sugar increases the lower leg injuries. And I have a theory about that. And that is because um, there are certain bacteria that escape through our gut lining and they settle in our joints. So there's a really interesting article about how uh, spontaneous Achilles ruptures, they found an, in, like, an abundance of staph in there. And they mm. took biopsies from the hamstrings of the same people. There, there was no staph. So the staph had settled into the, um, the area of the joints and tendons and inflame, you know, probably in part of the inflammation process. And so basically um, what's happening is that there, any kind of feeding of this pathogenic bacteria, they become overabundant and they start to settle in those joints and tissues. And uh, we actually see a, a really high increase in Achilles problems and diabetics as well. So the literature has been there for years. Um, and I do believe that it's the sugar that's feeding these pathogenic bacteria and then they're settling in the joints. Now, this is a very pioneering theory and hypothesis and there's not a lot of research about it. I wrote a whole article about that too. Um, and uh, the different things you can do to mitigate that, that I especially things I tell my clients, uh, of course, anti-inflammatory supplements like curcumin help with that, um, fish oil, things like that. But um, the number one thing I tell them to do is actually intake coconut oil, which has monolaurin, which is one of the only things that is shown to kill staph. So not only on exterior, like uh, I use coconut oil as my, my lotion after I get out of the shower uh, because it's antimicrobial, antibacterial, but it kills it on the uh, outside and on the inside. Um, so it's, they, they start doing shots of coconut oil for Achilles tendonitis. Um, and uh, there's a method to that. So how much and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. but it definitely helps. So the, this bacteria, uh, it all comes back to our gut microbiome again. It's really fascinating. Sometimes I think, um, wow, like who's really in charge here? Is it, do we, are we really in charge or is it our three pounds of gut bacteria, you know, microbiome bacteria, like that are making all of the choices for us. They're making all of our, you know, different vitamins for us. They're dictating our, our brain health, our respiratory health. And we can talk about that if you want with the Prevotella, but, um, it, you know, basically the, the activity of these bacteria are dictating a lot of what's going on in our health. It, it, it's insane. Yeah. I mean, we're just uh, trying to figure it out. I know it's, it's hard science to do and we're kind of at the, the beginning end of it, but I think it's dictating how much sugar people eat and that, that sugar, that, that voice, I did a graphic a long time ago about that, the sugar monster talking to you. If people cut out all of the, the carbs and sugars, th they'll see, they don't have those same cravings. And that I think is, is exactly what you're talking about. Your gut bacteria do dictate your actions. Right. They're, um, you know, they're, ta they're 
uh, interfering or not interfering, but they're uh, influencing our neurotransmitter responses. I mean, everything really. So, uh, and what people don't realize, and I'll, I'll talk about the Prevotella a little bit. Prevotella is a type of um, bacteria that is found in people that eat an abundance of carbohydrates, starches, um, and also uh, vegans and vegetarians. So they have tend to have more Prevotella than um, than meat eaters. And so meat eaters have more Bacteroides, which is not to be confused with Bacteroidetes, which is a mm. different classification. Um, so again, when you start to read the science on this, it becomes a little less intimidating with these names. But um, Bacteroides you have from meat eaters and also, coincidentally, people who do high intense activities tend to develop this um, Bacteroides more. Why is this important? Well, with COVID nineteen, for instance, you can look up this research. It's right there in the you know in PubMed. Mm. But uh, if you had more Bacteroides, you were less likely to have severe COVID. Mm. If you had more Prevotella, in fact, Prevotella overabundance was associated with severity of COVID. So you were more likely to die from COVID if you had a Prevotella overabundance. And then you say, okay, well, what kind of foods give me a Prevotella overabundance? Carbohydrates starches and vegan and vegetarian diets i mean what what do, <laughs> what else do you need to know okay well i dove a little further into the research why is this happening it turns out that prevotella tends to love loves to be a host to viruses and the viruses attached to the dna in the bacteria what people don't realize is that our gut microbiome has way more dna than we do i mean like just exponentially mm -hmm. amounts of DNA than we have DNA in ourselves. So they attach the DNA in the bacteria like Prevotella, and then it goes through our respiratory system, especially up to our brain through the, um, you know, through the different axes. There's a, a gut brain axis and a gut respiratory axis. Again, I don't think people realize that, but it's through the mucosal lining. So if you, you know, you have to keep that mucosal lining intact. We could talk about that all day. But the Prevotella, long story short, is associated with almost every chronic illness. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is Prevotella copri overabundance. Um, if you have, um, you know, if women have bacterial infections uh, down below, that is actually a Prevotella infection. And so you would think that, well, that makes sense. If they're eating high sugar, uh, that sort of thing, you cut that out, those infections go away. Uh, so you really have to look at what's going on and what's creating these bacteria overabundances and, um, you know, what's, what's affecting these bacteria. So I thought it was really interesting when India had that big surge because we all know that they're pretty heavily plant-based, right, in India. So they're not eating mm -hmm. as much beef and that sort of thing. Um, so I thought, well, it looks like Prevotella overabundance to me, but nobody's talking about it. You'll never hear about it in mainstream media. Well, yeah, that's how it goes. Well, I want to get back into the plant-based stuff too. We're talking about injuries and stuff like that. The, we, you don't get all of the building blocks of your tissues if you're not eating meat and animal foods. It's cutting out Yeah, a little. that's correct. Can, Can you, you hear, hear me? me okay? Because we froze. Yeah. Yeah. Our, the screen is a little frozen. Yeah, it froze but up, but... Um, <laughs> Okay, that, that's better. Okay, so yeah, um, absolutely. That, you're going to see an increase in injuries on, on plant-based diets because you don't have the building blocks. Like you said, you don't have uh, carnitine. Carnitine and taurine are what uh, heal soft tissue injuries. And you're going to find that in abundance, especially in red meat, um, but in uh, animal protein-based diet, not a plant-based diet. So it doesn't surprise me. Uh, sometimes I see like these elite athletes and they're showing what they're eating, um, you know, on Instagram or whatever. And then they're showing that they didn't make the Olympic team or they're so sad they didn't, fell short of their goals. And I'm like, man, I wish I could help them. <laughs> I wish I could just, you know, be like, ah, it's because you're eating, you know, yeah. beyond, be beyond meat instead of an actual burger. <laughs> like, but I can, I only help those who really, really seek my help and need my help. Um, frankly, I had, I've been yeah, yeah. so busy this year that I've had to, it's been an, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay. It's an Olympic year, so I've been so busy this year. I had to cut back on taking new clients, and um, uh, I have a waiting period now. But uh, yeah, so I see it all the time, and I, I really only share the advice when I'm asked because people just get, you know, I, of all the issues I speak about, people are most offended by red meat and sprinting, which is hilarious. <laughs> I get the same pushback as well, uh, especially from women. When I start talking about red meat, I kind of joke around that I left LA because I couldn't meet a girl that ate red meat, but I'm also kind of serious. <laughs> and, and now I'm in Texas and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, it's still a little hard, you know, it's just so against the norm which is one reason why I wanted to talk to you. You look amazing in your age and you're fast and you're healthy. And, you know, you're, you're talking about being steak adapted. You're over here eating red meat. You know, there, there's so many examples of this. I just love that from the female side, I want to make red meat cool again. You know, like, let's get girls around this. Like, yeah. come on. Well, and also, especially we should get girls around this because red meat is the number one food for hormone balance. I mean, what female doesn't want hormone balance and what male doesn't want their female counterpart to have <laughs> hormone balance, right? So, yeah, um, yeah you, you, so you've got, uh, what I found too is that I think you probably know, I don't know if you've had a podcast about this, but, um, you know, whether people have issues with methylation or uptaking B vitamins, but generally if you have a high red meat diet, this takes care of this issue a lot of the time because you're getting such an influx of B12 and folate from the red meat. And uh, you eat nose to tail. I like beef liver. I'm a really big fan of liver in general. Um, mm -hmm. So that's packed with B12 and folate. And so you really need this for hormone balance. And you need it especially as we age. Not only that, you need to be able to build the muscle tissue as we age. Now, I don't think I look like some big bulky, you know, bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe females are afraid that if they eat too much protein, they'll get bulky or something like that. But that's not what happens. Like I, you know, and I guess this is where I differentiate from keto. Like I think the blend that I um, am a proponent of is like you, like it's more of a carnivore keto paleo type blend. Um, and so I, don't, I think the protein is more important, basically. So while I think keto can work for some fat loss, uh, some quick fat loss, I think that it's more important for females for hormone balance, especially as we age, to have that protein because we're less likely to absorb protein as we age. So we need to increase our protein. We need to build that muscle mass because the muscles actually release hormones too. And people don't realize that. So your muscles are really important for all kinds of things, not just moving you around. So yes, women, let's get on board. I eat red meat five to seven times a week minimum. I feel fantastic. As soon as it, I start chewing, all those uh, signals are starting to go off. I feel amazing. Um, there are some tricks to digesting it. If you haven't eaten red meat in a long time, um, I would say you start, You what I usually have people do is they start changing the order of their food. So if you go out to a restaurant and they serve you um, bread and then a salad, and then an entree, of course, you're not going to digest your meat correctly because you, you've already ruined your stomach acid with the, mm. with the initial mm. appetizers, right? So you really need to actually digest protein first because protein stimulates your hydrochloric acid and pepsin and all the things you need to have proper pH and proper digestion. So you really need that pH to be low or acidic so that you can ward off virus pathogenic viruses you can digest your food correctly you don't get foodborne uh, pathogens that sort of thing um so yeah so start eating your protein as your first bite of every meal and um definitely try to include that red meat five to seven times a week and uh, you'll find a huge energy difference because it's sparking things like dopamine and acetylcholine uh, which gives you tons of energy um yeah it yeah, and I think I've heard that before. People just say they can't digest it, and I'm saying you're not around if you can't digest meat. You know, I mean, there is some <laughs> problem. Like humans wouldn't be around if we couldn't digest meat. So there, yeah, I mean, I I, I get it. There's some problem, or it's been too long, or you you don't have the the right, uh, you know, you're not producing the right bile acids and different things. And I, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but I know you you can take some sort of supplements, or I don't know if it's bile acid, what it is, but you 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 can work yeah, with you it, can take, as a practitioner. Yeah, I mean 
you can take some hydrochloric acid, um, if, you know, supplement if you need to, but I actually don't even really find the need to that if I just mm -hmm. change the order of the eating mm -hmm. with my clients. And sometimes if they've been, if they're coming straight off of plant-based, I have them supplement a beef protein shake first. They find that easier to digest. And then that starts to stimulate all of the things they need to digest the meat. So um, I'm sponsored by ATP Labs. They have an uh, awesome line of products and they have a supreme beef protein powder that that's really high quality. It tastes like chocolate marshmallows or vanilla marshmallows. So it doesn't taste like a steak. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I start them off with that. And then that starts to stimulate all the, and then change the order they're eating. It starts to stimulate their digestive process. I had someone tell me on social media not too long ago, you can't eat a steak before you race the 400 because it won't digest. <laughs> and I'm like, oh Lord. And I think they said like, get a biology book 101 or something like that. Oh, and I was yeah. like, oh man. Okay, block delete. You know, they like don't I don't know. have time for that. That's so <laughs> and I have funny. An too. Yeah, I just I have an assistant that just you know she'll. I don't have notifications on for my social oh, media, that. so I don't always catch it right away. But she'll like let me know and be like, I'll be like, oh, block delete. I don't, you know, I don't have time for any of the negativity. And what I always say, like what I said on, when we were interviewed on Tucker, was, um, you know, champions uh, don't place value on the opinions of others. We don't. So uh, I encourage everyone to stick up for what they believe in, and that includes red meat eating. So I actually write letters to my local paper because we have a, a, a band of local vegans that will write letters all the time to the editor. And I feel like, geez, they're like really getting this false information out there. And mm -hmm. then I write the letters right back and I talk about how great it is we have Maui Cattle Company here, which is, you know, building our Ina and replenishing the soil from the former sugarcane lands, which strip the soil. Like I just go right after, right after them in the paper as well. <laughs> Please keep doing that. Uh, yeah, and Maui Nui is over there. I, I, um, I actually maybe yeah. I haven't even thought about this, but they, they make great venison product. I connected with Jacob, and I'm going to be releasing some of their. Um, I'm going to make biltong with them, and we're going to have the Maui Nui venison. That's all. I love that free range. It's yeah, it's an invasive species, and it's but it eats an amazing mm -hmm. diet out in, out in Maui, and they harvest it in this really cool way. So uh, look forward to that. Yeah. I love their, I, I take their sticks, their venison sticks to the beach for a beach snack. I love that. And then I don't know if you've noticed, but I just took up a new hobby in my off season. Um, I just started shooting uh, a bow and arrow. And so I hope to pick off some of those pests and have some more venison. My husband, you know, does fine with hunting and so, uh, mm -hmm. and our friends. So we always have venison, but I would love to be able to get one myself. Uh, and I'm excited. I had my first day of shooting yesterday and it was Ooh. a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm hooked. <laughs> That's so cool. You are the female role model. You are the hero. You. <laughs> I really want to, yeah, just get this message out there. And even your daughter. We'll bring up your daughter because we're going to get her on the line soon. Uh, I've never had a okay. yeah, young person on the podcast yet. And I think it's really great that um, she's eating red meat. She's a great athlete. She was on Tucker. You, you may briefly mentioned you're on Tucker's. So you're on Tucker Carlson uh, giving some of your message, which is really cool. And uh, yeah, maybe you can kind of, before she comes on, just talk about, uh, yeah, how your sort of ideas have translated into your, your kids. Yeah. So I think a lot of people, oh, okay, you know, let's be frank, the media and um, some, you know, select billionaires are pushing their plant-based agenda for economic purposes and whatever, you know, they're, mm. they're pushing their own agenda for their own reasons. And it's not to keep people healthy. And we know this because we see how people thrive off of a red meat based diet. And it's no wonder that, uh, you know, recently there was an article about how uh, red meat is actually beneficial to add in for heart health like the opposite of what we've been hearing for years. Uh, of course, that made sense to me because it's high in carnitine, which is great for heart health. So I digress. The reason I'm saying this is because people are fooled into believing they should actually keep, make their children plant-based. And I recently had a conversation with a frustrated grandmother whose son was divorcing his wife because the wife insisted that the child, who's like two, I believe, become vegan. And they had a big fight about it and they're divorcing because the dad, like they're, mm. he's totally against this. And as well, he should be, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. that's a form of child abuse. You do not need to have your children to be vegan. Um, all of the science points to the fact 
that the most malnourished children in the world are the ones that don't have access to meat. It's just a fact. They need the meat to grow. My daughter, she's probably going to be embarrassed I'm mentioning this, but she has a vegan friend who's tiny. She's very short. My daughter, and, and small, and, you know, frankly, looks like not maybe particularly strong. And so my daughter, on the other hand, is almost six feet tall. And so I, my kids eat meat and nuts and berries for breakfast. They do not eat breakfast cereal. Um, and so they eat like, you know, steak or steak with, you know, um, walnuts and strawberries, or they'll eat chicken and almonds and blueberries, something like that. Um, that's what they start their day off with. So this can be extended to children. It's not a diet. It's a way of eating. Um, when my first, my daughter first started eating gluten-free, I remember some family members, distant family members were like, oh, why is she on this diet? And we, just for simplicity's sake at the time, because she was only five, um, we said, uh, well, she's allergic to gluten. And they said, oh, okay, then we understand. But really, everyone is has an allergy to gluten. We can get, you know, you've gotten into that in your past podcasts, whether it's the glyphosate or the, the gluten protein causing the uh, tight junctions to open up. Like, but that answer they accepted. So we've been doing this for a while. When she was five, she told the bank teller, well, in North Carolina, where we moved from, the banks would give you a lollipop to the, for the kids. I don't know if you've ever mm -hmm. seen that on the yeah. mainland, but uh, yeah. So the bank teller tried to give her a lollipop when she was five and she said, no, thank you. I don't eat high fructose corn syrup. Yes. <laughs> so this is, this is the type of child I raised. She's now 16. So she came from, that was about the time we started making all the changes because that's the time I started uh, being introduced to the work of Charles Bullican and his teachings. And so, um, you know, she's been thriving ever since and she's obviously growing very well being almost six feet tall. And I'm not, I'm, you know, just maybe 5'10". There's no other female in our family that that's, that's that tall. And the men are about topping off at about 6'2 or 6'3 or something like that. So it's not like we have, you know, 6'6 six, mm. six or 7 feet or, you know, anything like that in our family. Um, but uh, yeah, and then so the boys are 7 and 8. They're also thriving and um, strong and healthy and happy and all that stuff. So yeah, we can get her on and you can ask her some questions she's a little shy at first but oh it'll be fine she, let's, she let's get her on let's uh press pause here okay. and get her on the line all right we're back with margaret cynthia's daughter how are you doing doing good how are you i'm good we've been talking about you we've been talking <laughs> about your athletic endeavors and your your meat eating and all that so uh yeah why don't you just tell us what sports you play or you know what's your favorite food stuff like that <laughs> Hi, I'm Margaret. I'm 16 years old. I run track and field. My events are the 400 and the 200, although I've been trying different events as well. Um, one of my favorite things to eat is probably like steak, any type of steak. I love red mm -hmm. meat, like burgers, ground beef, all that stuff. And it really just makes me feel good. And most protein in general does. I love it. Yeah, we were talking about how that's kind of rare. I, I meet a lot of females that just seem to always want to avoid red meat. Do you find that, especially with the younger crowd? Yeah, uh, all of my friends, or a lot of them, think that going vegan or eating like more greens and vegetables is super healthy with you. And I'm often like asked, like, "What? Why are you eating that? Like, it's not good for you." But like, I know how good it is for me, and I know how I feel so much healthier when I eat protein and red meat, and how like dairy and sugar and like just not eating protein makes me feel terrible. Well, that's good that you're actually listening to your body. And I guess you're, you're listening to your mom as yeah. well. She's like helping you with the science part too. Yes, definitely. Learned so much. Probably from a little too much. Uh. <laughs> she's, tired of, she's tired of hearing me talk about the science. <laughs> well, it's important. No, but learning because, a lot. Well, yeah, no, all the doctors are saying the opposite, right? What, what have you encountered? Have you encountered any you know, teachers or doctors saying anything to you? Yeah, a few of my teachers are like vegetarian and vegan and they talk about it, but I know it's not true because I've like heard the science and I know my mom reads a ton of science and I've, I know that in my personal experience, it just makes me feel better. Yeah. Well, you can't argue with that. And <laughs> so do you, do you eat steak before your track meets as well? I do. I have a, a bag of steak that I eat before my track meet right before <laughs> I run as like a snack. <laughs> 
That's so great. I actually, yeah, so I did a pentathlon. So I was, I, I brought this up in the beginning. I, I was training for a decathlon. There was no decathlon in the Masters uh, Championships for North America. Cynthia, we need to do a, a Masters event together. I don't know when the next, the, yeah, when the next championships it. are. Yeah. You know what would be great to do too, Brian, is encourage others to join us and do that too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, like, they can, we, let's like, you know, we can pick one of the meets and we can say like, come join us at this meet um, and run. You know, because you don't have to qualify. You can just sign up for it. So you can be a beginner sprinter and absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah, because of COVID, the last one got canceled. I was so fired up. There was one in Toronto. The, the, it was going to be mm -hmm. the world championship masters and I was all ready to go and all that. And it That's got right. canceled, but it, it won't be till next year. Right. So it's going to be next summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah. So then people have be, some time to train. Right. There will be an indoor cha national championship, which may be in New York. I think I'm definitely going to that one. And then outdoors will be, um, there should be a national championship and a world championship in Finland which sounds mm. really fun. Wow. Well, I hope they have the decathlon this time because I want to pole vault. I started pole vaulting again. And, uh, oh, so I brought this up. So I did the pentathlon and I didn't eat, I did it fasted. And I did have, the only food I had is I took a little liver with me. I had a little bit of raw liver and I think I had like a one bite of sausage. And that's all I ate all day. It started at noon and I was fine till 6 p.m. I did all five events and all the other athletes there were, you know, guzzling the gels and the Gatorades and the, all the weird granola bars yeah. and they they thought i was insane so i can imagine you know you're sitting here at a, a high school track meet eating steak <laughs> must be weird yeah but i know that it's good for my body and i know it's gonna enhance my performance so i don't really care what other people think <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. And I guess we should bring this up. I, I, I never like to get into the political stuff because I'm into the food and health world. But a lot of times the political stuff kind of gets into our world. Like we were talking about the meat. They're trying to, you know, go plant based and there's legislation being proposed about meat. They're pushing these plant based diets. And then with sports, too. Right. If it, th these politics are affecting our sports. So I saw a clip of you on Tucker Carlson, which was cool, talking about some of these issues that you've seen in, in your athletics? Yes, I, I have. Um, I, in my freshman year of high school, I had to race against a transgender athlete, and I ended up taking second in the first heat of my first ever high school track meet to this individual, and I feel like that was a very unfair experience. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, there's a lot of science around it of just even if you do transition, you still the, the person would still have grown up many years of their life building the mechanics and the strength and the muscles and all this as as a male. So, um, yeah. What, so what did what did what did you um, think about that or, or how I don't know the solution to this, but what what are your thoughts? Seeing as how I trained so hard for this meet and it was my first ever track meet, I felt it was unfair that this individual who was biologically stronger came in and def uh, won this race. And all my teammates were super stressed out as well. One of them even said that they don't know the point to doing track anymore if they were just going to continue to get displaced and lose out on opportunities for scholarships and running track in maybe college or winning state championships. So I feel is that this might be erasing women's sports and it definitely needs to be changed. Mm. Yeah, and maybe mom, you could talk about it. Uh, it's, it it, it kind of is going against what we want, right? We want women to be able to have more opportunities. Yeah, so, um, so I can't, someone said to me, um, someone, uh, I think it was my aunt, I believe she was, she's in her fifties. She said, um, gosh, women have fought so long for equal opportunity. And now that we finally have some, the men just want to take it from us again. Mm. <laughs> so I thought, you know, from her generation, it's a different perspective because, um, you know, they've been uh, fighting for these. Me, I came in and I was uh, able to have a scholarship for college because of Patsy Mink, who's from Maui. Uh, she's the founder of Title IX. Title IX is the document that... Um, 
was uh, put into place for equal opportunities for women to have scholarships in colleges and things like that. So basically, they ha they, if you have a certain amount of men's teams in a, at a college, you have to have an equal amount of women's teams, like something like that, right? So you have to have an equal amount of opportunities for women. Um, so it's really especially important to us because we honor Patsy Mink and her mission, and that's being erased right now. Title IX basically was just erased by the current administration who said that it, it now it, they consider it to include transgender individuals. So it's defeating the purpose of creating these opportunities for women. Now, the other side, they will argue, well, if you just say you're a woman, then you're a woman, period. You're not allowed to talk about childbirth or menstrual cycles or anything like that, which are, that's reality. So what world are we living in where it's not reality? Uh, what you said was true. It doesn't matter if you take hormones. So even after hormone therapy and gender reassignment surgery, male-bodied athletes still have a clear advantage over female athletes. There are several studies that came out that pointed this out. Um, the Lundberg study is the most recent one, but I always say, frankly, we don't need science to tell us this. It's common sense. Uh, but if you do look at the science, there, uh, there are things called satellite cells, which make myonuclei, which make the muscle fibers, and the men have more of these. Um, and especially it does increase in testosterone and puberty, but even before puberty, in the womb, these changes are already there where they're more likely to develop this muscle tissue. So um, even the proponents who say like, okay, well, let's, let's uh, propon be a proponent of uh, puberty blockers, which is a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that just is another whole story. Mm -hmm. But those uh, people uh, are also, that's not the solution because this is happening all the way earlier in the womb, like I said. So um, we really just need to stand up and speak up for fairness in athletics because uh, for instance, the NCAA just uh, lost their ruling and now they have to compensate athletes. So even more is at stake for our, our daughters, you know, our granddaughters, sisters. Uh, so we really need to just be brave and stand up and speak up for what you know in your gut and common sense is true. This is, uh, not, this is about having compassion for all individuals. Let's give everyone an opportunity and by only uh, pretending that the struggles of the transgender athletes are real, we displace our female athletes and we discredit their uh, female athletes' feelings. So mm. biological females. So we really, you know, we, my daughter and I have a passion for standing up and speaking up about this, not only because she had this experience, but I also had this experience. I raced in the World Championships in Malaga, Spain in 2018 against a biological male. Now, I did win my race mm. uh, in that one. Well, we won't say win. I I placed in my heat ahead of this individual. Um, but six months later, in a much shorter event, this individual came back and took a spot on the podium from my teammate in a different event. So just because one girl in a you know schoolyard can beat one boy in one race, it doesn't mean that all the girls can beat all the boys in all the races, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Well, well, I'm glad you are speaking up on this. I mean, we need to hear the other side. I'm always into hearing both sides of the issues. And it seems like in the mainstream, you only get the one side. So thank you. for Yeah, you do only get the one side yeah. because they censor stories like ours. That's what we found. We were very appreciative to Tucker for, um, and, you know, Fox for having us on because this should not be a political issue. Everyone we know whether they're Democrat, Republican, whatever, they all agree that this issue is not fair. Like we, I mean, I pull uh, my family members and I mean, probably anyone listening could do the same and everyone seems to be in agreement or either that or they're not sure because they've heard this information that oh, hormones change, the, you know, make it mm -hmm. fair, which is not true. I'm telling you, this is not true. And from a science point of view, there's plenty of science to back that up. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, you know, my, my message and Margaret's message is to just, you know, trust your instinct, trust your common sense, and uh, let's keep uh, sport fair for everyone so that women can continue to have these opportunities um, for, you know, for scholarships and prize money and uh, accolades, awards. It's more than just, uh, and, and no, you know, just because it's not a gold medal at her first high school race doesn't mean that she shouldn't have had the opportunity to cash in on all of her hard work and win her heat, right? Mm -hmm. Which well, was the beginning heat. It was supposed to be for beginners in track. You it know. sounds really discouraging, Margaret, that, yeah, that it's, most of all, it just sounds like it, it could discourage you or your peers for, to even try. Yeah, definitely. I know a lot of my peers were saying that 
And I'm just going to keep working harder and harder, but definitely speaking out on this issue as well to make sure it's heard for other girls like me who might be in the same position. Awesome. I love it. I got one more question because I heard you don't have a cell phone. And I think that's so cool. I love um, getting into all of the different things that will help people be better, right? We talked a lot about food and nutrition and uh, exercise today, but we, we kind of skipped out on sleep, which I know Cynthia is really into, and it's so huge. I just did a, a full podcast with Dr. Kirk Parsley about sleep. Uh, very important. All these lifestyle factors are important. You, you mentioned gratitude, giving back. Um, and so the last piece of the puzzle, I think, is kind of the, the stress and just uh, modern distractions and all that stuff that goes on that really goes on around the phone. So how, how is it not having a phone? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't have a cell phone and I found it to be beneficial in a lot of ways for not having to like check it every two seconds or being distracted by it. I get really good sleep and I'm not staying up all night on a phone. I don't have to worry about what other people are saying about me on social media. Like I feel found it's very beneficial and I know there's a lot of scientific reasons why it's beneficial too as far as like blue light goes and how that is on stress and things like that yeah and affecting your sleep and so how do people get how a hold many, of you? how many hours of sleep are you getting hmm. Margaret at grandma and grandpa's house right now um at least 10 every night oh. I mm -hmm. get a lot of sleep she's a, she's, a, she's a 10 to 11 hour sleeper <laughs> yeah. Brian. well that's how you're six feet or however tall you are yeah, <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> you got you, yeah all the good things happen in your sleep that's uh what i talked about with dr kirk farsley your muscle grows your your brain i mean all your thoughts and uh all the things mm -hmm. that you learned over the day you know kind of yeah sink in so that's great. So then how to be, so you can still live a normal life though. You're not some crazy oddball. People can still get a hold of you. Yes. If I need to call mom or anybody, I can borrow somebody else's phone or at school. I just borrow the office phone if there's anything wrong. And I think if my mom's generation can survive without cell phones everywhere, then I think my generation can as well. <laughs> Well, I was on the verge of that generation. So yeah, I got by without a cell phone through high school pretty much. So it is, it is possible. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, well, it was, I, I do, I don't want to be one of those old guys that talks about the good old days and, you know, it, it was nice though, right? It was nice. I got a hold of anyone, right? You, you have your house phone, you, you figure it out. So yeah, my, I'm, I'm a little older. So, um, you know, how I grew up was we had, we didn't even have the cordless phones yet. We had that, I think, right when I was graduating high school, but we had the regular phone on the wall with the really, really long cord. And if I needed privacy, I'd go down the stairs around the corner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that was fun. But, um, you know, like, like she said, like, if we need to get a hold of her, there's always a way. And also, uh, she does have an Instagram account, but she is not very active on it. And I think, you know, especially now that we speak up, like she's, she can't be a target for any of this, uh, these haters, but even beyond that, like she's seen her friends, uh, um, you know, go through really, uh, disruptive social things like just over drama over social media comments and uh, we know for a fact that it decreases dopamine like why do I choose not to give my daughter a cell phone well I know that it decreases dopamine and she needs that not only for her race but for her education um, we know that it di uh, it disrupts sleep and we know that also um, uh, Charles was, would talk about how before the age of 12, before puberty, it actually dis disrupts the thyroid, the EMFs that are coming from um, basically electronics, like mm -hmm. even computers, he said, are disrupting the thyroid. So we have a whole generation of kids who are at a disadvantage um, metabolically already because of the EMFs and uh, things like that. Um, also, we didn't talk about, but I'm also really against um, Bluetooth and uh, the AirPods mm -hmm. or Beats or anything like that. My athletes uh, don't use them, or if they do, they get yelled at by me, mm -hmm. <laughs> so they know better. But um, yeah, there's no need to microwave our, our brain. 
Um, and people will say, oh, this, you know, you're so crazy. You know, that's the, the research isn't there, but it is really there, especially in Europe. So um, my daughter is privy to this information. Um, she knows she doesn't use any of those. Um, and, you know, she doesn't, she's not having that phone with her all the time. So she's less likely to have that thyroid disruption. Now she'll get it, you know, probably from different things in the school with the Wi-Fi and things like that, that you can't avoid, but the less, the better, right? Same with the chemicals in our environment. If we can cut down on the amount of chemicals or cut down on the EMFs, the better we're mm -hmm. going to be set up to thrive. I love it. You got to do it all. Think about all these um, ancestral, I just call it ancestral hacking. I hate the, the term biohacking, right? Biohacking, it's like, oh, like gadgets mm. and gizmos. I'm saying let's ancestral yeah. hack, right? Let's ancestral hack. I like that hack. much better. How do we and, live um, a life yeah. that humans should live? And exactly. That's basically what you've that, laid and out. And I don't know if you've ever done that DNA, the DNA test, but... Um, mm. We are, we scored one of those scores where we're like 95% more Neanderthal than uh, the other people who took the genetic mm -hmm. test. <laughs> Have you taken that? So, I, I mean, I feel like we're totally, uh, and I think Neanderthals are, are greatly misunderstood. I think they're probably a lot oh. smarter and healthier than um, people think. But I'm really into right now researching that time period. Um, I have a great book I'm reading about like d the DNA of where we come from. It gets really down into the, the DNA of the different civilizations and especially in Hawaii. Um, as you know, by my book, I'm very inspired by early Hawaiian civilization. And uh, there was like a Mu civilization that was here before the Hawaiians. And I'm just getting into like the whole DNA of all that and, and how they were thriving. So I really mm. love to help my local community members who are Hawaiian um, get back to their ancestral eating. And, and that doesn't include plate lunches and mac and cheese uh, mm -hmm. and things like that, or, you know, mac, mac salad, salad. Foods, yeah. yeah, with, um, you know, uh, show you chicken. That's not how they used to eat. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I really uh, love to help them find their true eating and um, what specimens the early Hawaiians were, right? We can... That's another story. <laughs> well, that's a whole other thing we far forgot to talk about. Yeah, I love that, the, the ancient runners, the, what are the Kukini? Mm -hmm. Yes, a lot of people, uh, even the local Hawaiians, a lot of them don't know all the stories about the Kukini, which are fascinating. They're the, the runners for the Ali'i or the kings. So they would run these uh, sometimes errands, but mostly they're important messengers. So they would um, go on these important mis missions for the king and they would run fast. Sometimes they would run far, uh, of course, but they were known to be very fast. And then they were not carbohydrate rich. They were actually very protein based fish and rare cooked poultry or basically raw chicken is what they ate. And they, they got the good stuff. Yeah, no, these people yeah. were high levels, you know, the, up with the, in the royalty and they got all the good proteins for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. And all Margaret, right. you know, gets to learn about all this. <laughs> and um, she's in a unique position where she can help her peers if, but she's in the same way where, you know, only if they ask. So she often um, will help them with things like acne and you can ask her about that. Like, but she, well, you know, yeah, that, that's a good she, tip. Like, tell, tell me some tips because I don't know anything about teenagers. <laughs> I'm too old, <laughs> but what, yeah. Like what, what, what kind of things um, do you help your friends with if they ask or what do they have problems with? Um, my friends have had problems with like their acne and what they're eating. And I found that limiting sugar and dairy is really good for my acne. Maybe. Yeah. We're having a little technical difficulties here. I can ask, ask mom here. Uh, what, what was the trick with the protein shakes when she was 11? Yeah, so I noticed around age 11 that um, she was starting to have some hormone type of mood, um, uh, I guess you'd say mood swings. And, um, I, you know, it's the type where I'd be like, okay, what? I don't know what just happened, what's happening here. And if you're a mom of a daughter, you know what I'm talking about, uh, or dad of a daughter. So um, what would happen is I noticed that if I would give her, uh, at the time we were drinking whey protein, if I would give her a whey protein shake with about um, 30 grams of protein, at least minimum, 30 to 40 grams of protein, um, I would give it to her and I'd send her to her room. And if she came out before eight minutes, it had not worked yet. And she would still be, uh, you know, a little frazzled. Mm -hmm. And then if it was after eight minutes or so, she would come back a completely different person. Um, and in, this is normal behavior. I just want to say, like, it's normal to have hormone shifts. But what I found is that the increased amount of protein 
helps to regulate those hormone extremes. And that's really at any age, to be frank. Um, it could ha you know, work with PMS issues for older women as well. But um, if you have young daughters that are going through this, um, and I, you know, actually I had a, a friend with a son, same thing. Um, just give them the protein shake, let them have a few minutes, you know, 10 minutes of time, and let that uh, protein help regulate the blood sugar. Because when the blood sugar is going up and down from being like uh, maybe carbohydrates or things like that, uh, then it's going to affect the hormones. So she really, um, she still drinks protein shakes to this day uh, during school. Mm -hmm. She'll take one with her to have at her uh, 10 o'clock break um, to really just keep everything balanced. That's great. And and if you can hear us, Margaret, maybe you could just uh, say, yeah, how, how did you f feel differently when you had the protein? Um, when I had protein, I felt just a better mood after all and more rational and just made my body feel better as well. All right. We were having some technical difficulties with the Maui Internet, but we can wrap this up. Uh, I have one last thing I just remembered. Cynthia, what, what is your blood work like? You're eating all this red meat. You know, are you doing all right? Are you dying? What's happening? <laughs> so my blood work, what, what about my blood work? I mean, red meat five to seven times a week uh, minimum. Uh, yeah. So my doctor actually says I have the best blood work he's ever seen in his life. And I ask for all of the extra tests. I ask for zinc, B12 folate, vitamin D. So he said, especially for casting the net that far, he's never seen anyone come back with like basically the perfect score in every category. Um, so he said, I am 100% behind what you're saying and doing. Keep doing it and um, keep helping others. I actually helped his wife with an autoimmune issue. Um, she had neuropathy for eight years and in about uh, five weeks, she had no more neuropathy. It's been about three years. So um, uh, that's another story. I how can did, tell you a million stories like that. Well, how'd if you, you want me that? to tell you. How'd you do oh. that? What was the intervention? Okay, so um, she was having chronic UTIs and had the neuropathy. So she would step out of bed in the morning and it would be like needles up her feet. And then she also had shooting pains up her arms. And so what I discovered was she was, um, she was taking some junk supplements for one thing. Um, and they were not high quality. They were from, uh, do you want me to say which company? I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't, <laughs> uh, but doTERRA, I'll just say mm -hmm. I've had, I've had to fix so many people from doTERRA supplements. I'm just going to say, mm -hmm. so, uh, maybe somebody needs that information. So I'm going to say it. Um, so she was, I had to take her off the junk supplements. I put her on, um, uh, some core foundational supplements like magnesium and zinc. She was especially zinc deficient. And what happens is if you have any type of um, heavy metal issues, you're going to be zinc deficient. And the zinc will help counteract that because it binds to the same receptors as those heavy metals. So um, this is not a diagnosis or medical advice. This, I'm just talking about like mm -hmm. what happened with her and what tends to happen with people who um, have heavy metal issues. And so I think that this was part of it. She was actually also diagnosed with Hashimoto's, but she didn't feel like she had it. And so uh, she, we changed her to increased red meat and we cut her sugar. And uh, yeah, basically that plus certain supplements. And she was in two weeks, she started having good days and she had never had good days before, like good day, bad day. She had always, always only had bad days for the past eight years. Um, and then we, she got to week five and she had no more bad days and it's been three years. So, um, uh, and then she never had a UTI again, actually either. And for that, uh, I used a supplement from um, Nutridyne, which is only practitioners can order, uh, but it's called uh, UT Soothe, and it's basically D-Manos. I don't know if you're familiar with D-Manos, but it binds to the E. coli and the urinary tract, and it flushes it out. So E. coli is why you have UTIs. It's actually, a, again, a bacterial overgrowth. We we're talking about how everything comes back to the, the microbiome. Mm -hmm. So we really had to change her microbiome. And uh, being that her husband was a doctor, like they had gone the Western route, uh, which again, like there is a time and a place for Western medicine. I'm not against it at all. But uh, because she had taken some rounds of antibiotics, it depleted her good bacteria. And it was, she was in this chronic cycle that she couldn't get out of and didn't quite know how to get out of. And so um, 
we just basically got her out of that cycle. So when I do my analysis, um, I'm really good at being able to read patterns. So I can even read patterns over the phone, but um, better to have the measurements in person um, with full analysis. And I can basically pinpoint uh, what's going on. People are usually shocked. I had one client a couple months ago that um, I told her she had mercury poisoning just based off of where she was holding her body fat and the ratio mm. between, between those places. And she was like, oh, no, there's no way and this and that. And I was like, you, you have heavy metal issues. I'm, I'm guessing you have mercury poisoning. And so she went to her naturopath and she did the hair test. And sure enough, she had mercury poisoning. She was just like floored. She couldn't believe that I could figure that out from uh, my experience in reading patterns and also the measurements. So that's like kind of what I do. And um, yeah, so my doctor not only stands behind me because I have the blood work that everyone dreams of, but that um, also because, uh, you know, I've fixed his wife and then he sent, like I said, he sends me patients um, who have autoimmune issues when their blood work comes back clean, but they're still having symptoms. Instead of saying it's all in your head, he sends them my way. And I also send him scientific research on different um, things that we talk about sometimes. So he's really open to hearing about root, root cause, but he's also there in case someone, he says, listen, Cynthia, like I'm trained in Western medicine, like it, it's black and white. If it's this, I prescribe this. That's mm -hmm. what I do. If it's the gray area, I'm sending them to you. <laughs> so wow. It's really yeah. awesome that he's open to that. Well, I'm glad we have people like you out there and you know, there's many others. So this is not a fluke just because her blood work is quote perfect. Uh, it's not just anecdotal. I'll tell you that I've seen it countless times. Uh, I've interviewed tons of people. I've interviewed tons of practitioners that can share the same stories. Uh, speaking of sharing, I think every female listening or male can share this with female friends, female relatives, anyone to let people know it's okay to eat red meat, uh, how to thrive. Um, all this stuff was great. Thanks so much for, to your daughter. She can't really hear us. We're kind of cutting in and out here. Um, thank you, Margaret. Uh, yeah, you're, you guys are inspirations. Where can people find you, um, Cynthia? Mahalo. Yeah, like I said, it's, our, it's my passion to help others thrive and be at their best. Um, I'm active on Instagram at fastover40. I try to rotate my posts um, to do with family and food and training. So I try to get a little bit of each in there and also remind people of how they can be their super horror, superhero warrior selves. Like they mm -hmm. really can find that within themselves, not to compare the, themselves to other people, but just to find that superhero within. Um, I have a warrior community on my website. You can become a member. I give sprint workouts. And uh, like I said, there's a support group there, recipes, all kinds of stuff on there. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to be there as much as I can for people to teach them what has worked for me and other people as well. That's so cool. And thanks for sending your book. It's a great little read, Fast Over 40. And yeah, maybe, well, we'll have to do a track meet sometime. Maybe uh, I can come to Maui when I come home for Christmas this year and uh, we can sprint on the beach. I love it. Absolutely. You're welcome anytime. All right. Take care. <laughs> okay. Mahalo. Aloha. All right. We did it. One more week. One more great bunch of knowledge from a great person. So give us a review on iTunes or the podcast app. Go to nosetail.org to check out all the meat, get free shipping, start back at episode one, share with a friend, and go to saping.org, join the newsletter. We got great stuff every two weeks. We find all kinds of content for you and produce original articles and some other stuff. So that's at saping.org. Get the meat at nosetail.org, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>